Hello everybody, I'm Nick, and this year we're going to take a deep dive into the record type that was added in C-Sharp 9 and was enhanced even further in C-Sharp 10. We're going to take a look at how it works and all the features around it, but also we're going to take a look at how exactly they managed to add the feature in the language without touching the CLR. And this is a very common mechanism that the C-Sharp team is actually using to add features without having to be very invasive when they do so. So even if you know how record works, check that part of the video because I do think you're going to find it interesting. If you like the content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell to get alerted when I upload a new video. Now, before I move on, I want to let you know that I just launched my From Zero to Hero Dependency Injection in .NET course. In that course, I take you from the very basics of dependency injection to the fundamentals. We do a deep dive into the DI framework itself. We see how we can use some pretty advanced patterns and approaches with the built-in DI framework, then see how we can extend it even further to add other behaviors. And then to top it all off, we build a dependency injection framework from scratch. This is by far the most complete dependency injection course you will find out there. Trust me, I checked all of them and will teach you everything you need from the very basics to some pretty, pretty advanced stuff. And it all comes from real world experience building huge scale microservices. Now, the first 100 of you who want to buy this course can use this code right here to get 15% off. So check it in the description, buy it if you want. And thank you very much for supporting the channel. So let's start from the beginning. I have a project here in .NET 6 running C Sharp 10. And what I want to do first is I want to go on and create a new record. So record is a new type we can create here. And many people actually seem to think that record is allocated in the memory in some different way, or it's like a, a structure behind the scenes or something. A record just by itself is just a class with special properties. That's it. It's still a reference type allocated on the heap. Nothing changes there. So I'm going to go ahead and create a person record here. And as you can see, this is a perfectly valid record. I don't have to have like angle brackets or like this syntax, this is still valid syntax, but I don't need to. I have this shorthand um, way of writing a record and I can actually have properties here. So I can say full name here and I can also say like date only date of birth. So this is a perfectly valid record. I can also write this record like this. I can go on and actually delete all that and write in this syntax and have them properties written in this way. So this is string full name and this is uh, date only date of birth. These can be uh, mutable, but ideally if we want this to be a one for one to this, you want them to be init only because they should only be initialized when you create the record. And then these can be default here. So these two approaches, well, same idea. Now you can totally see why we want to go with the first one is more concise. We don't need to expand to this full version. We're going to see when we need to. Now, actually, before I move on in C Sharp 10, and I've talked about this in the C Sharp 10 video, we now also have support for a record structs. So I can have a record struct and let's say person has struct. And now this is also perfectly valid. I can have a record, which is a struct the value type. Um, and also, because a record was added first to represent a class, you can also be explicit and say record class. But as you can see, Rider detects it and says, this is redundant, you can remove it. So if you just see record, assume that it is a class. And if you want it to be a struct, you have to explicitly specify it. But we don't need to touch on that any further. Now, what's the benefits of having a record type? Well, there's actually quite a few. Let's go here and initialize um, a person. Let's say Nick here, right? So I'm going to say new person. I'm going to say Nick Japses and then new date only 1999. And then here we go. So we have Nick. Well, if this was a class and actually for reference and no pun intended, I'm going to make a proper class version of this same um, record. So this is a class. I'm going to call it person as class. So let's have that as class as well. I'm going to go on and say Nick as class here. Say new person as class and have the same full name and um, date of birth. Now, if I go ahead and I print this and say console.writeline and I print this object and I'm gonna run this code now, as you can see, all I get is the name of the type. And this is how classes behave, right? This is proper behavior. It's gonna use the two string um, method behind the scenes and that's what the default two string method does. However, if I use a record 
look what happens now. I'm going to get a description of everything in that type, whether that is the full name and that's the date uh, of birth. So I get the actual properties of the thing printed. Now, here's something interesting. If I copy a class here twice and I say Nick as class two, and this is one, and I say Nick as class equals Nick uh, as class two, right? What do you think will happen when I run this code? Well, I'd expect you to say it's going to print false because this is an equality check and we'll check the reference. And since these are two completely different objects allocated in different locations in memory, pointing to different things, there is no reason why this equality check would say true, even though the properties are the same. However, in record world, if I say Nick equals Nick2 and the properties match, then it will say true because equality check checks for the properties, not for the reference. So that's another thing about records. Now, even though records can have mutable elements in them, mutable properties, the properties you initialize here are immutable. So let me just move this underneath here and we can continue uh, talking about this. So they're immutable. However, you can not really change them, but you can create other records and mutate in that new record through a pure function uh, some of those properties, the ones you want. So let's say Nick, but older, right? So then you can have uh, Nick equals Nick with, so I'm using the with operator, and let's say a date of birth, and that is just one year ago, let's say, so 1992. So what this will do now, and let me just print it, um, and also print the previous one to prove that nothing changed in the previous one. So we're going to run this and print Nick, and then Nick, but older. You can see that the first person was not mutated in any way, shape or form, but the new one seems to have been cloned into a new object. And that's a completely new reference um, with a new property here, the one I specified here. Now, what's interesting about this uh, within like copying process is that you can actually override this if you wanted to. You can go here in the record and you can create a protect person constructor, which actually by default has been already generated for you behind the scenes. And you can have the old version of the person here, and then you can do whatever you want with those properties. So the default behavior is all person equals uh, full name, and then date of birth, uh, where are we? Date of birth equals old person dot date of birth. So that's how it will behave out of the box. And if I run this, you will see that it's the same thing, uh, but you can totally change that if you uh, like to do so. Now, if you actually want to check the references to see if the references match, because like we said, if you do one of these, if you say, uh, let me delete that. If you say Nick equals to Nick two, because they have the same exact uh, properties, you're going to get true. But if you actually want to check the references, you can totally use the um, reference equals method that exists in every type. So you can say reference equals to this, and then that will actually check the references, detect that it's different and return the truth. So a nice thing in case you need it handy. Another cool feature is that you can actually deconstruct these positional uh, parameters here. So if I want to get var name, comma var date of birth, I can do that by simply pointing to the record and this will deconstruct. And I can actually do this in the shorthand way I forgot. So if I do that, I can get the properties without having to do Nick dot and Nick dot to get them. And these will actually print themselves. Let's quickly run this and see that, yep, it returns the name and the date of birth. And this comes out of the box. Again, we haven't actually touched anything in the record. This is just bog standard behavior. Records also do support inheritance. So if you want a record to inherit from another one, you can totally do that. It's not prevented. By the way, in case you want to have a difference printing mechanism like visualization, because when I'm printing a record, I'm getting this format here. You can totally override that. So you can go here and say, override the print parameters method, and then you get the string builder and you can use the parameters to print this however you want um, and return true in the end. So I can say builder dot append my full name is and then point to that. So let's say full name and then also append uh, date of birth is and then date of birth. And you can see that this is what the default was printing. But the moment we run this now, you can see that it's different. 
I mean, I screwed up the formatting significantly. This should be here and this should be here. I'm just run this again because that looks weird. Yeah, that's better. But you can totally override this if you want to do so. Now, with all that said, how was this feature implemented? Do you ever think about that? How How is this possible? Well, if you remember a while ago, I talked to you about a feature called lowering, and that's part of the compilation process. It happens before your code is turned into IL code. It effectively transforms high-level features like record into lower-level features. And it will also do it with other things like loops and a bunch of other things, switches. I, I can't even name them all. You're going to watch that video if you want to get a full recap on the feature. But let's see how lowering works on a record, which will actually tell us what a record really is. So you can go on this website called sharplab.io, which is great to see lower code. This is the website. And I have selected to convert C sharp code into C sharp code but that's the lowered c -sharp code, and that's going to be in release mode. And I'm going to paste just a record here. I can delete this bit. So let's see what the compiler generates. And actually, because this is a very small window and I can't reformat the size, I'm going to copy that and paste it into VS Code and see what that looks like there. Here we go. So this is all the code that the compiler will generate. And actually, see, that's the original line we started from, and this is what it generated, which is quite a bit, but you don't want to see what it does when you write a single weight. So let's focus on that for now. And let's see what it does. So it's going to first generate a, a compiler generated embedded attribute, uh, then a nullable attribute for the nullability checks, then a nullable context attribute. That's quite a bit there. Then here's our record. It is really a class that implements the I equitable um, interface. And then it has the backing fields for the two properties. So properties are really a backing field, which is well, a field, and then getters and setters, whichever ones you choose to um, have. And then it has an equality contract, which you can actually override if you want to. This is virtual. So I can go back into the compiler. And if you want to change that, you can say override equality contract and have your own here. And this just returns that it is the type of person. Then you can see the full name being split into the getter that returns the field and the init only method that will initialize the field. Same for the date time. And then you see the public constructor that is added because we generate the class like this. So effectively, this is this. And then you have the two string method, which is using that string builder we saw before. Remember where we could override this print members method? Well, this is the print members method. That's the default behavior. And that's what the part where we override. And that's why when we changed it, the person and the first angle bracket stayed the same, but the rest were overridden. And this is how it will print. Then you can see the equality operator overrides. So the not equals and the equals are overridden to point to the also overridden equals operator, which is here. And if you see what it does behind the scenes, it uses a quality comparer to compare the two uh, contracts with the backing fields. So it will check the fields themselves here, not actually the references. And this is all ties up into the operators overridden here and here, and also the hash code um, is overridden to return the same thing. And then you have the clone method, and this clone method is used when you do the with operation. I'm going to show that in a second. And then you have this protected uh, constructor, which is what I talked about. It is this secret copy constructor that is used to move from one uh, person to the other when you're doing this uh, cloning, this copying using the with operator. And then you have the deconstruct void method, which is used when you deconstruct the record to its properties. So this is all that happens behind the scenes. And you can see that the compiler team didn't have to change anything other than magically make this change from record to this monster, which supports what a record is. Now, let's see what happens when I do use the with operator. And I have that here. Let me just copy it again because I literally can't show you anything here. So if I paste it again, let's go all the way up to see where withing happens. So here's what with does. It will create a new object using the previous properties that you had when it was originally created. And then we'll use that clone method that you saw down below and then set each property that you're mutating. But you're not really mutating the first one. You're just setting it when you create the new one. And this is what we will do. It will just allow us to use that new name, for example, here. And that's all there is to it. This idea of features being added using this process of lowering them 
uh, into lower levels that the CLR already supports is very, very common. And once you understand it, you also understand your code better because you start to put the pieces together and understand how things are made. And this helps you with performance and knowledge of the language as well. And I hope you learned something in this video. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making these videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video. Subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.